Welcome to the Docs Who Lift podcast, where we distill and simplify the complexities of a healthy lifestyle, exercise, medicine, and weight loss. We're excited to bring you a podcast that's a prescription for clinical practice, scientific recommendations, and just real life. This this is the Docs Who Lift podcast. Hey, and welcome back to the Docs Who Lift podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Nadolski. i got my co-host, Dr. Carl Nadolski, and with us we have special guest, Amy Geckel. Welcome. She's going to be talking about uh, her eating disorder diaries that she uh, talks about online and uh, her own history and everything like that. As we haven't really, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't talked about that on the podcast. We've touched on it a little bit, I think, last year, um, but... Uh, not enough. And, um, and it's certainly something that is so important, not only to us when in our lives dealing, uh, you know, talking to patients who are struggling with obesity and, and uh, complications of obesity, but, you know, across the board for so many people, um, I think it's more prevalent, unfortunately, with other complicating issues. So yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Welcome, Amy. Great, thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Dr. Carl was just on my podcast, The Eating Disorder Diaries, that will be coming out very soon. Um, But yeah, I launched my podcast this year because eating disorders aren't talked about enough and it felt so stigmatized for so long. And I almost felt embarrassed saying to someone, I suffered from bulimia and that's not embarrassing at all. We I think that the more that we talk about eating disorders and how others have been able to heal from eating disorders like myself the more that it's going to benefit others who are suffering from something really similar. So that's what I'm really trying to do with my podcast overall. I'm originally from Michigan, living in Denver, Colorado now. So most of the episodes have been recorded here. Spencer, do you know where she went to college? Uh, Michigan State. Uh, We already did our Go Green, Go White on our other podcast. (laughs) Oh, nice. Where did you grow up? In East Lansing. Oh, in East Lansing. Where are you, Okemos or something? Which high school? Well, actually, Lansing Catholic High School. I also okay. talked in my podcast about how my parents uh, sent me to a public school for a while, but then I started really acting out. So it was oh. Catholic oh. school she goes. All right. Wow. <laughs> okay. And then you really started acting up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, no, I don't know if that was a good joke or not. But anyway. Uh, well, well uh, he just got me fired just, again. I get fired every episode. So Spencer just got me <laughs> fired again. You know, I didn't even say it. <laughs> okay. So I want to go through your history and like, cause yeah, it's, it's good to bring light to all this. Um, you know, there's probably people out there struggling that don't even, maybe they even understand it. They don't even know what's going on. Um, yeah. And you know, you already brought up an, a very interesting point about how people don't talk about it enough. And you said you were, you know, there was almost an embarrassment about it. And on your podcast, you know, we touched a little bit on the internalized weight bias and stigma for people struggling with obesity. But there must be a, a very significant internalized bias, stigma, et cetera, with, with disordered eating. Oh, there absolutely is. From, from a very young age, I had developed an eating disorder. And something that, that drew me to following Dr. Carl on social media was that he has posted about how childhood trauma has related to disordered eating later on in life. And I'm very open on my podcast and on social media about how I endured childhood trauma. I was sexually abused as a child. And I think as Mm. a direct result, I developed a pretty severe eating disorder. And really on top of that, just a lot of self-hatred in general. And I think my whole life, my whole upbringing from age 13, I'm, I'm 30 now. So I was on and off with suffering from bulimia for over a decade of my life. And I think that my entire life, I was just surrounded by the shame that I felt for myself. I had a lot of internal shame and I've studied a lot about shame for the podcast. And I've read that internalized shame is really uniquely predictive of bulimia where externalized shame or worrying about what other people are thinking of you is really predictive of anorexia. And I had just a lot of internal shame about, you know, everything in my life because I thought that what had happened to me was my fault growing up. So I think that I would just hide everything in my life and and lie about my behaviors. And a lot of that was lying about my disordered eating habits. So I couldn't even really confront the issue myself. And once I finally did, and I 
just a lot of changes in my life. And I've talked about a lot about what I've done to heal in my own podcast. But once I finally started facing my issues head on and facing my trauma and processing it, was I finally able to get rid of this shame, realize this is not an embarrassing thing, realize this is something that's important and something that I feel called to talk about, have I really been able to get to this point of the healed person that I am today? Do you feel comfortable talking about um, like when, how it all like started and when you st- like, what made you want to start the bulimic behavior, that type of thing? Like, mm-hmm. and then like, I guess, could people talk about like, they feel like that was the one thing and they could control you know, so like, can you explain any of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, so my, the abuse in my childhood started at a young age. Um, it's something that I still struggle with pinpointing the exact ages on, but you know, six to nine ballparking Mm. that get into middle school where my period is starting. My hormones are raging. I'm changing. I'm developing as a woman that's when everything really hit home for me and started to make itself known that something had happened to me as a kid. And now I'm going to start acting out, hence going to the Catholic school. Um, But I, in middle school, I got wind of a few girls that had started engaging in those behaviors. And I don't remember exactly what, you know, I was like, I need to try this, but I did. I, I ended up trying it. Like, like one young girl does. And when I saw that I had lost weight after doing it, it really just became my addiction from there. Um, And I really truly didn't start healing until maybe six years later. But even after that, it would then come back in my life. So I would maybe go for a year or something without it, but then it would come back full force. And it was really disturbing to me. So at that point in my life, when, when I would take breaks from having the behaviors, I wasn't processing any of my past trauma. And really only when I started to become completely behavior free is because I am doing EMDR and therapy. I'm actively processing this trauma and I no longer feel like this trauma is stuck in my body. And I, and I don't think I need to have these behaviors to really be like really the numbing of what I've been trying to hide from feeling in my life. How did you get to a point where you knew you needed to address it? It's like, you know, how did you know it was even a problem necessarily? That You know, that's what it's, it's hard, you know, for maybe some people to comprehend. How did you even get to the point where you were able to maybe seek help or um, realize, hey, this is, this is an issue. I need to go get help, uh, let alone actually being able to succeed and and utilize the help because that doesn't always, you know, sometimes it's, that doesn't always work. Right. Right. Absolutely. I, I'd gone a few years behavior free. And then all of a sudden I had a rough mental health day and the behaviors came back in full force and they did not leave. And at this point it really disturbed me. So I'm in my early twenties and I'm like, "I, I thought we were done with this. What the heck is going on? So that's when I went to my first therapist and I've been on quite a therapy journey. And let me take that back. My parents knew when I was in high school Mm. that I was suffering. Mm. So I did go to therapy in high school, but I never talked about my past trauma. I never really confronted it. I said I was fine. And to be honest, I did think I was fine in a lot of ways because I wasn't at a point in my life where I had met myself there. So when the behaviors came back in my 20s, I realized that that this was something a lot deeper and it still took many many years of finding the right therapist being in the right relationship making sure that I'm eating the right things moving like doing all of the things I'm we we talked in my podcast with Dr. Carl about the word holistic and I I am very into holistic healing and wanting to understand every single aspect of myself so I think that you know, once I realized that the behaviors were still in me and I realized that I needed to dig deeper is really when I started doing more of the the healing work. When you first started, was there a, a part of like body dissatisfaction or what, what was the impetus to go like, hey, I see these other girls doing this. I'm going to do this because I want to look a certain way or what did it? Yeah, I do think so. I grew up um, 
in the top percentiles in height and weight as a child. Like even from, you know, age one or two, I was always in the top percentiles. So that was hard for me, for me coming, you know, from someone who doesn't have a bigger body, but at the time, you know, I was taller than my peers and by default, because I was taller, weighed more than my peers. Mm. So I always felt I needed to change something in my body. And to be honest with coupled with being assaulted as a child, it just made me really hate my body Mm. in a lot of ways. I had so many years of self-hate and it's something that I still am working on today. I would say I'm so much more empathetic with myself and show myself so much more grace, but I do find that I have such patterned thoughts in my head that I have to really consciously realize when I'm thinking a negative thought and replace that with a, with a positive thought. And that's really helped me throughout the years get to, you know, a point where I'm, I'm thinking happy thoughts rather than terrible negative self thoughts that I had for so many years. You know, so Spencer, um, on, on her podcast, just before this, we were talking about, uh, you know, I, I told her how I think through medical training and residency and all that stuff, we as physicians all learn that, you know, we need to be aware of these things that they happen and and that we need to um, be on the lookout for patients. But it's hard. Not all of us are experts in, you know, psychology or psychiatry or whatever. And, and I'm really, and our healthcare dysfunction system, you know, right, it, it doesn't necessarily support really our primary care doctors getting to really dig deep and, and know people enough. And so, you know, I think you and I have certainly learned a lot from patients when we do the weight history. And that's how these things have come up, right? When you and I do a good weight history, if we let the patients really tell us that, well, this is when I started gaining weight and there's no other trigger. And suddenly they say, and, and it just, it, 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 like, this is usually a lighthearted podcast, but this is pretty heartbreaking that they more often than not tell me, well, okay, I had this, you know, a sexual abuse, a sexual trauma. And I, I was just about to look up the the epidemiology of some of these disordered eating issues, but I have a really bad feeling that we are missing a lot of it and it is way more prevalent that, than we thought. And, you know, I don't necessarily have an answer or anything, but I, I guess I'm just telling you, we all should be more aware of it, but I don't know. I don't think we're catching enough of this. Yeah. The Kaiser, I mean, that was the, what I can't remember his name, the, the first to really study adverse childhood events. So, um, there are screener tests for it. Uh, in fact, we could probably implement it into our digital system. But so you you talk about this on your in your diaries. Like, who else have you had on that has that has discussed their? Um, and you don't have to say specific names. But what what other things are you seeing that you'd love to bring to light for this podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I so far have nine entries out, and much more to come. Some of them are solo episodes, but some of the interviews I've done, my my thought for this season is I want it to really be about my story and how people can mm-hmm. take away things from what I've learned and really apply it in their own life. That's my goal because I think I went through hell and I didn't think I would ever get better. And here I am today. I'm in a happy relationship. I'm in, I'm living in a place that I love. I'm, I'm in a good headspace. I, I also allow myself to not binge eat, but enjoy food a lot more than I used to. Um, so far in the episodes, I've actually interviewed my therapist to get her perspective on, you know, how, dealing with your trauma in therapy can really help you if you have an eating disorder and just help you in your life in general. I've interviewed my parents to get their perspectives on what they would have done differently in back in the day when they first realized I had an eating disorder. And actually my, my mom had a really good answer to it. And it was when I was 14 and I was going to a nutritionist and a therapist and telling them I'm fine they believed me. So my mom believed Mm -hmm. the nutritionist. And, you know, I was just really, I was not in a place to even say I wasn't fine. Right. So now we know more about how serious these diseases are and how much deeper we really have to go. So I think that was important. Um, I've also emailed, you know, interviewed uh, someone from Barstool Sports who is a Lansing native himself, Chris Castellani. He talks about his own experience with addiction and with overcoming an eating disorder. And I think in that episode, what I really took away was that 
men don't talk about their mental health enough. And I think I... I I work in corporate America, and fortunately, we have these resource groups where we're able to talk about our mental health. And and that's something that I hear all the time is that men just want to tough it out and feel better, but pretend that they're feeling better all of the time when really it's, it's, there's no stigma. There should be no shame in in getting help. Like we're all human. We've all gone through things. We've, We've all dealt with things. And I think a lot of people are surprised when I've come forward in corporate America and said, I have a podcast. It's about healing from trauma and eating disorders. But I think really the takeaway is don't have shame and there are ways to get the help you need. Casey and I talk about our our mental health by making jokes about it. (laughs) Right. And and it's, you know, it's, it's funny, but it's, but it's true. I mean, you just, didn't you just send a a meme today about, uh, it was a meme. I, I basically send memes that make light of our whatever mental health issues that we, we, you know, we laugh about it, but it's, but it is true. And, and so, you know, a a great takeaway from what you're talking about and what we've experienced with our patients is, yeah, it is not your fault. You are not broken. You know, you're you're not broken. Um, and a lot of people are struggling with a different variety of these things. Obviously we, you and I had talked on your podcast about how I see a lot of, you know, binge eating as disordered eating that came from, you know, childhood trauma. growing up and, and it's presenting, it's getting referred to me because of obesity, diabetes, et cetera. And, and we have not only behavioral therapy, but we do have some medication therapy that, that we can use from the physician standpoint, but w- you know, we got to get the patients in. So people out there listening, if, if you are at all struggling with, you know, disordered eating or, um, you know, if you have a history of trauma and it might be adversely affecting you, I, we got to get people to reach out to their primary care doctors and utilize any and all resources we have available. We definitely need more psychologists and counselors to to help us all out. Amy, have, did you ever discuss pharmacotherapy to help? I didn't. And that's something that I talk about in one of my episodes. I've never really been one. And you guys can yell at me or the doctors here. I've never <laughs> really been one to like even take an Advil. I, I just have not been interested in taking medicine as a band-aid, but I think that there were times where I was in crisis mode where I could have really benefited from it. There were times where I was just, I, I would say they were my dark days where I could have gotten help a lot sooner. And I think medicine could have helped with that. Yeah. Whenever I talk about band-aids, people are like, what's wrong with band-aids? They help stop bleeding. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say that. And, um, and, but, but it is, you know, none of us want, you know, yeah, we shouldn't just take medicine haphazardly. We also shouldn't avoid medicine purely out of principle. So for those out there, like you just kind of said, and uh, yeah, sometimes you need a Band-Aid to stop the bleeding, but also, um, you know, some of the medications like I talked to you about that help with binge eating disorder, they really do, you know, get to some of the um, internal biology and and actually kind of help the, the root cause while the true, true, true root cause of that, you know, maybe childhood trauma needs to be addressed with, you know, psychotherapy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera. So, um, you know, we, again, that's, and that's holistic, right? So treating the whole person is all of that stuff and may include medications, um, you know, when, when benefits are going to outweigh the risks and, and stuff like that. So for people out there listening, absolutely use all your resources. Okay. So you had some relapses, now you're how old? 30? Yep. 30. And like, how do you feel? Like, do you feel like you feel like you're in a good space now? And what exactly are you doing right now to like stay there? And like, and, and do you monitor like you have, you probably ebbs and flows at some point and within this normal range. Do you ever feel yourself like, oh, I, I feel like I'm going to the dark side, like you said, um, and then you do something about it? Or is it you're like, no, I don't think I'll ever get to that point again. Or how, what are you feeling like? I think I can confidently say right now that I don't think I will ever engage in behaviors again, but I also want to give myself grace and say that if that happens, then that's okay. Like I've taken a million steps forward. And if I take one step back, then that's one thing. But I love that you're asking about this. I do a lot to maintain the place that I'm at now. Um, One of them is the relationship that I'm in now. I think that I was in a lot of relationships previously that I knew were not 
for me. Uh, even if I was dating a good person, I just knew something in me. I wasn't being, I wasn't honoring myself. I wasn't being authentic to myself. When I finally leaned in, broke up with whoever I was dating and, and found the person that I'm with now, who I genuinely feel like is, you know, my soulmate, my counterpart, I was able to, to step into more of the authentic person that I am now. Aside from that, because I have a very like normal day-to-day life, um, I live and breathe by my routines. I wake up every single day and I do a guided meditation on YouTube, uh, usually about a 10 minute, you know, guided meditation, sending positive energy for the day. I think that really helps me out. And then I journal every single day. I have three journals, which I know sounds excessive, but it really works for me. Um, Two of the journals are super short and I think are accessible to anyone and I love them. So they are five year journals. Basically what it is, is you know, today I went through and I wrote two sentences down about what I'm doing today. You know, I'm coming on your podcast. I did the same thing on this day last year. So I was able to see what I was doing last year. So I can kind of see patterns throughout the years um, of what I'm doing on a daily basis. The other journal that's a short journal is it asks me a question on the same day. I can't remember exactly what it asked me today, but it'll just ask you something. And it's fun to see how my answers have changed throughout the years. I also, my longer journal, I try to write in it every day, but that's not as accessible for me. You know, I'm, I'm working from home. So sometimes I have an early meeting, whatever it is, I'm on vacation, but I do find that, you know, just doing a word dump. I love my coffee in the morning and I feel very caffeinated. So I'm just writing whatever I'm thinking for the day, whether it's a takeaway from my meditation or what I'm looking forward to. And I mentioned this to Dr. Carl already, but I sign every single journal entry with I love you at the end because I spent so many years not telling myself that. So it really helps. I I now have a friendship with myself. And, you know, aside from that, um, the routine I need, if I don't do the routine, then I I notice that I'm in a funky headspace, but I'm also pretty active. I, I go to a gym out here in Denver and also, oh my gosh, just Colorado in general with the mountains, we're always doing something outside. Um, that's fun yeah it is really fun do you guys ever come out to Colorado Ben you were just there Casey I was just there yeah I mean I had not ever been there other than flying through Denver and and we actually just went my my wife's uh, aunt and uncle have a place in Keystone and they were big skiers and I don't ski um, but we wanted to get the kids out there let them try it and and yeah we had a great time it was beautiful Um, got to do all sorts of different things not only just skiing but uh, went on some adventures and, and stuff like that so it was great for mental health. I, I was just going to oh, say, I had uh, I was on a different podcast with a guy named Gary Foster. He's a psychologist, PhD, behavior change guy. He talks about like, you know, like body positivity, talking to yourself as a friend. Like you wouldn't call yourself a piece of shit. You, like a friend shouldn't call you a piece of shit unless it's my brother talking to me after a wrestling match. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh God. Let's bring up, well, let's bring up <laughs> my child. Oh my God. No, no. I'm kidding. Um, oh no, I, anyway, that's, that's a, that's a whole nother episode. No, but, but, but talk, talk, you know, like talking yourself, like, Hey, a friend wouldn't like make you feel that way. So it sounds like, you know, when you write a good a, a, friend, I, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, the, people do that yeah no i know but like yeah, a good, a good, but you know. like you know t- you saying i love you you're you're doing great whatever um that's no that's that's a good that's a good practice yeah and and i think a lot of what you just said is probably good for everyone but especially what we're talking about and it, and i noticed that you are actively essentially treating yourself right do you f- so you know we in in obesity and type 2 diabetes and some of these uh diseases we talk about you can't reverse it. You can't cure it. We put it into remission, perhaps. Depends on how you define those things, right? But um, for example, obesity is a chronic disease. That's why p- people are always, even if they lose weight, right? And we, you and I talked about how weight is not actually what we care about. We care about their health, what's on the inside from, from mind to, to body, physical, physical health. Um, but it always needs to be treated, even if you end up with, you know, what someone might consider a normal, quote unquote, normal weight, good metabolic health, good mental health, et cetera. But they're still always treating it. They're still preventing it from relapsing because it is a relapsing disease. I feel like that's similar to, to maybe disordered eating and what you're talking about because you are consistently treating it. Every day. it in remission. Yeah. Do you think that's uh, accurate? 
Yes. And this is kind of blowing my mind because I know it's very obvious to the both of you, but thinking about relapsing with obesity is just something that's never really crossed my mind before. So that's really interesting. And I think that on top of the routines that I have every single day, I I still have other tools that I'm using that I think that anyone suffering from anything would benefit from. And I, I go to weekly therapy right now. So I really benefit from talking to a therapist, even when I don't want to. And I also just started seeing a nutritionist because I just want to know more about nutrition in general. I think by default, I consider myself a pretty healthy eater, but I've in the two sessions that I've been to, I've, I've already learned more about what is mindful eating and putting away my phone and not eating so quickly and eating more of a balanced meal. So that's been great. And lastly, I, I go to a support group and I try to go weekly, but it's just been unbelievable to be able to connect with so many folks in my community who can relate to something that I'm going through, you know, whether it's disordered eating or whether we're just talking about a crappy day that we had. And so I really think that others can, can benefit from that, even if they don't have an eating disorder, finding some kind of community support. Could you describe, so you were, you mentioned you started purging. Did, were you binging and then purging or is it just like, I'm just eating and then just purging. Yeah, definitely. So I can absolutely relate to what one would consider a binge eating episode. Okay. So then when talking about nutrition, do you feel those, do you, what, what, what do you feel like triggered, like, um, triggers your wanting to binge? Like, do you feel that little monster on your shoulder going, Hey, go do it. Absolutely. And I don't really feel it anymore. I'm able to really okay, notice when I have the monster. Um, I think in one of my most recent episodes, and this really relates to someone who has a menstrual cycle, but you know, for people to be able to track their menstrual cycle and realize like when a woman is in the luteal phase and she's going to be craving mm-hmm. a lot of food, lean into those cravings. You don't have to get mad at yourself for wanting to eat yeah. food. And that took me a while to understand and really track, honestly. So I think that being able to to understand where I'm at, what time of the month it is, whatever it is, and just kind of like be more aware of everything in my life. And I think I can do that because I'm so mindful now with my journaling and where I'm at. Give yourself permission. Yes, absolutely. As opposed to like further restrict, which may worsen it. Yeah. Here, here's a question for you, and this this will get a little bit personal. I don't think Spencer ever dealt with this, but and people sometimes get mad at at you know me or others when I try to make this, you know, I try to use myself as an example. But you know, I, I told you I wrestled in college, right? Wrestlers cut weight. We certainly are probably some of the prime examples of maybe men with some body dysmorphia and issues like that, and we have overly restrictive you know habits to to make weight and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and Spencer knows this and I actually, I think I'm a lot better now. Um, and it hasn't adversely affected my life, but certainly back then when it really, really mattered, if I leaned in and allowed myself to go, um, like with say pizza or ice cream, right? Spencer, you know, this Mm -hmm. stuff, right? I mean, I literally, if we looked up the definition of binge eating, I definitely in the past have fit those definitions. And while I didn't ever purge, um, in that way, I probably engaged in exercise bulimia to make up for it. And, um, you know, so let's say if I was eating pizza and I was like, all right, I want a piece, I'm going to have one piece. Next thing I know, I would not stop. And I kind of say to myself, and this uh, once in a while still happens, I'm not going to lie. Um, I say, ah, F it. I'm eating the whole thing and I don't stop. And it's amazing. And then, so you feel out of control. You almost, you know, and then I would feel guilty about it, right? These are like criteria for binge eating. So it's interesting about the, you know, kind of the leaning in and allowing yourself. I don't know. I don't know if I can, sometimes I feel like I couldn't have done, I didn't do it. I mean, I, that was, I almost, I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. I guess I'm just throwing it out there saying I I do, people don't realize it. They think, oh my God, I know what you, you know, all this other stuff, but I actually do um, understand it a little bit because of that past night. And I'd also think I'm, by far not alone of athletes who, you know, have, have maybe struggled with that in the past. And sometimes we get away with it, right. Because of our exercise and other dietary habits, or at least it looks like we get away with it. Still not healthy. 
Yeah, I think there's a a really fine line that you're edging when you do allow yourself to kind of indulge. And I think it's really just being cognizant of the behaviors that you have. So if this is a repeated behavior for you, if this becomes a problem, if this really impacts your mental health, then it's time to take a step back and, and do something about it. You know, I was caught up in the cycle for so long that I was never able to break break free. It was literally just, I couldn't get out of it. So I think I don't have an answer for it either, but I think that the more aware that you are of your behaviors, the better off you'll be. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, and maybe, maybe we'll have to get a, you know, we had a, I told you we had a psychologist on for the, you just published it, didn't you Spencer? Mm-hmm. Our, our podcast on, uh, you know, internalized weight bias and stigma. And maybe we need to get another psychologist on to get a kind of the aspect from the psychologist perspective on this too. Um, it, it'll be like a whole, I, these have been some of the most fascinating podcasts we've done because we are not mental health experts. We just know how important it is and we deal with it so much. And talking to that psychologist and talking to you, I, to be honest, have been some of the most fascinating and enlightening to me. I, so yeah, I know this might sound sappy, but I really, you know, we appreciate it for sure. We're we're gonna end up getting therapy in real time during the <laughs> yes, podcast. I know, my God, we're yeah, we're we're literally getting. We should be paying you whatever the hourly rate is. For. You guys cope by sending each other memes, making fun of your <laughs> yeah, mental health. God, we're I'd be like, ah, uh, that's what. Yeah, is that yeah, is that normal? Is that not is that, a, is that not what you're supposed to do? Not good for our mental health. <laughs> my my younger sister as well, so I can totally relate to the back and forth. You guys have. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, anything else you want to discuss? I mean, I think it's you know it's, it's just good to just go like, hey, this is much more prevalent. Yeah, your people are not alone. You are not alone out there, and there's all sorts of different varieties of these uh, disorders that just raising awareness, knowing you're not alone. It's not your fault. Seek help. I was going to say the the numbers that I've found since I started doing the podcast are are crazy. Uh, 30 million Americans alone reportedly have suffered from an eating disorder. And again, that's just reportable that's, data. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's only reported. That's what makes One me- One in 10 people. Yeah, I, I was, I'm really worried it's a lot higher than that. Yeah, because we, I mean, we try to screen for it even in our program and our obesity. So we can look at, yeah, they have obesity and people are like, well- if they have obesity, it's fine. And technically you can still treat them, but we do, we're very careful. Um, binge eating is, is the medicines can help with that. But the bulimia, uh, part of it though, um, uh, I think would require outside counsel. So, um, yeah. so we're, and I, I think people don't tell us everything. We ask about laxatives and, and purging and all sorts of different things. And she, I, she was talking about how for a long time she was like, I'm fine. Yeah, right? I mean, they, the people aren't always going to say it, and yeah. so we need people to open up. I probably wouldn't. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I would. I, no, I wouldn't either. I would say, ah, you know what? I'm all right. I just, you know, me, my brother and I make fun of each other for our problems, and then, uh, you know, but I'm fine. And maybe we're not. I, you know, geez. I did a bodybuilding competition once, and only once, and like, you know, I was getting getting down there, and I was eating very few calories, like 2,200, which is good for most people. Like that's a lot, but it's like for me, it was not much. And I probably wasn't even eating that much because there, there were times where I'd get home and I'm like, oh my God, I'd eat a whole thing of whatever. And I wouldn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed about it. Oh, and that's right. Like, so you did go through a little bit of what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that was your experience. Whereas I, yeah, I, mean, I, that was, I literally was dealing with that almost on a weekly basis. That was horrible. I did, you know, uh, we, a biological urge though. So did you, is that what you felt like? It was like a biological, like, did you feel like, right. It's, there's a, it's because people talk about it's only psychological, but uh, once it, there's, at some point, it becomes biological. Yeah. I mean, with obesity and stuff, we talk about how all that biology drives people. So when people are, you know, like cutting weight for wrestling, cutting, cu- you know, cutting weight for bodybuilding, that's a, a similar, slightly different, but similar biology that's driving those behaviors too. Because, you know, I always tell people this, this dysfunctional circuitry of our energy balance system, it becomes, you know, it's, it's dysfunctional and your frontal lobe that your executive function Knows maybe not to do it, but the biology overrides it. You just can't help it. Do you, did you feel that way? Oh, a hundred percent. And and that's what is so difficult because I think, I mean, not just the classic PMS of wanting to eat more then, but it was like when I get into a cycle of binge eating, it really is like I just can't stop. Find me the next piece of food. I don't care what it is. I just mm-hmm. need to use this like a drug, literally, like yeah. just a wow. numbing agent. Oh, this is fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on. 
guys, this is great. I really appreciate it. I would love to stay connected. I have some friends out in Holland. So yeah. all right. Nice. In person. Yeah. Definitely get get together sometime. All right. And so they can find you online at which social media? Yes. Instagram at the eating disorder diaries. I tell everyone they can email me if they want to talk. Um, it's the eating disorder diaries at gmail.com. And my podcast is anywhere you get your podcast, the eating disorder diaries. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Uh, anybody listen, share this if you can relate and know somebody that may be going through this. Everyone pass, pass it on. I mean, this is great. This great information. Help people out. Here's our outro. This podcast is for entertainment and education and information purposes only. Remember, the physicians on this podcast are not your physician. It should not be considered professional or personalized medical advice. It should not be used to replace speaking with your physician or medical professional to discuss your specific health concerns. The topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose or treat any condition. As a result, we are not responsible for any unwanted medical outcomes. The views and opinions discussed are of those of the host only and do not represent those of any other entities.